Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Pete Irig. I'm the teaching pastor at the Island Community Church. This is a uh, continuing series of what we call Island Connect. On Wednesday nights, we do a study together and do some fellowship. Um, and of course, I've tried to do this live stream, but the bandwidth just wasn't cutting it. And so I'm trying to try to record this and, and make it available to everybody. And, and I'll try to do this every week. So we've been in the what I call the life of Paul. This is part six. And today we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians, the background of 1 Corinthians. The goals and objectives of, of these studies is it's not to replace your Bible study. It's not to replace the sermons, the Sunday schools, BSF, whatever you're doing, small group studies. We believe that everybody can get better at interpreting scripture. So our Wednesday night series has always been trying to figure out topics and things that will give you the tools to do Bible study even better. Uh, everybody can get better at this, uh, no matter how long you've been doing it. And so the goal of this study, this ongoing series, is to give you the context of Paul's life and work to help you with studying his letters or interpreting them, because there's so much there. And uh, I, by way of recap, I know probably some people haven't been through the other uh, parts, but I just wanted to recap what we've gone through so far, some, some of the main points. So, so far, we saw that Paul was born in Tarsus, which is in current Turkey, Asia Minor, in about 5 BC. His father was a Roman citizen. Don't know why, but we kind of surmised that he did something good in the Roman Civil Wars for the winning side, i.e. Uh, Augustus. His father was a Roman citizen, therefore Paul was automatically a Roman citizen. And at some point, they sent Paul to Jerusalem to train as a Pharisee, which was a big deal. Um, and then Paul started persecuting Christians. He, of course, had the encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, which changed his life, obviously. And then uh, subsequent to that, he did three long missionary journeys as an apostle to the Gentiles across the entire Roman Empire and started many churches and basically was one of the key things that, that uh, spread Christianity through the Roman Empire at that time. Uh, I went back to Jerusalem after that, the missionary journey uh, got crosswise with a crowd. The crowd was going to beat him. Roman centurion grabbed him, and he claimed, "Hey, I'm, I'm a, I'm a citizen. I'm a, I'm a Roman citizen." So, based on that, they put him under house arrest in in uh, Judea for two years. He then claimed uh, the right to a trial in Rome, and so they shipped him to Rome. Uh, he was in. Uh, house arrest for uh, a while in Rome, and then was subsequently executed in 66 AD in the first Christian persecution under Nero. Um, we looked at one of the sessions was Paul's a Roman, and I think the key takeaway there is at the height of the Roman Empire, he was a Roman citizen from the provinces, and that was unique. Not everybody was a citizen at the time when he lived, uh, matter of fact, most of the people who were citizens lived in Italy or Rome. The provinces, you were kind of just under the, the governor, and but he was a, a citizen, which was a big deal in that time. And he, he used that, and he probably added four and a half years to his ministry because he claimed that right as a Roman. Then we looked at Paul as a Jew. Um, you know, what we talked about was what made the Jews uh, in their minds and their their scripture special. Well, God gave the Jews the Torah, the law, the law of Moses, gave them the temple uh, in Jerusalem. So uh, uh, that's where God lived on the earth and then also gave them a land. And you can think about, well, how did the Jews in Paul's time think about this? Well, they still had the Torah. They had the second temple. The first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians but the land they don't have, the temple was still in the kind of general authority of, of the Sadducees, but they were collaborating with the Romans, the pagans. So things were really tough and they really wanted the Messiah to come back. Um, this whole period where, where Christ and, and the apostles were living in that first century is also known as the Second Temple Judaism, uh, which is, again, the Second Temple that was uh, rebuilt in Jerusalem. The, the, the takeaway that we had there was there was a whole bunch of groups, a very swirly time. You had the Sadducees who were in charge of the temple and they were kind of collaborators with the Romans. 
the Pharisees were like the ortho orthodox Jews. They were like holier than thou. They studied the, the Torah intensely and they wanted everybody else to follow the law of Moses down to the letter. You had the zealots, which were, hey, I'm not waiting for the Messiah. Let's go overthrow the Romans and any collaborators now. Uh, the Essenes were uh, kind of a mystic monastic cults that said, forget about all you people. I'm just going out in the deserts and and that's where we got the Dead Sea Scrolls from. And then you have a, a big chunk of Judaism was the diaspora or the Hellenized Jews. These are the Greek speaking Jews that were all over the Roman Empire in Alexandria and Antioch and Rome and every single major town and every major city had you know synagogues. And But these people were kind of, uh, they didn't usually speak Aramaic, they spoke Greek. Um, and then you've had the massive peasantry within Judea itself that just looked at these groups and say, I'm, you know, I'm just living my life. I think the important part here that we noted that Paul was trained as a Pharisee. So that was a big deal because it was very rigorous training, ultra orthodox. He knew the scripture inside and out, had memorized it. And um, so wherever he went, if they found he was a Pharisee, and he walked into the synagogue that gave him instant credibility with those people. Then we talked about Paul as an apostle. Uh, with his conversion, uh, he basically became the apostle to the Gentiles. He, and there was a lot of controversy. He had to go through a lot of discussion with Peter and the other apostles in Jer Jerusalem to say, well, do you have to be a Jew? Do you have to convert to Judaism in order to follow Jesus? There was a lot of debate about that in the first years and uh, Paul's opinion was, no, you, you, know, the, the, you don't have to keep kosher. You don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to do the sacrifices. Jesus is the sacrifice. Everyone is the same in Jesus. And of course, that everybody came in line with that. But Paul, through his entire career as, a, as an apostle, as reflected in his letters, fought against that like every day. Because there was always people with different voices saying, oh, no, no, no you've got to be circumcised. And then we saw that, you know, basically Paul was in conflict with everybody. He was in conflict with the Jews when he'd go to a synagogue in a town and start preaching the risen Messiah, Jesus. And the Jews would be like, what? Who are you? What are you talking about? And of course, the pagans would say, there's only one God and this Jesus, the, ones that, the one that we executed was the son of God. What are you talking about? The Romans just didn't like anybody stirring up trouble. And then you had uh, a group that uh, is normally called the Judaizers. These are the Christians that would say, no, you have to convert to Judaism in order to follow Christ. And Paul always fought against that. So everywhere Paul went, he was in trouble. He stirred up trouble. He was beaten, stoned, ran out of town, uh, in jail, you name it. Now, we then started to look at the Paul's epistles. Epistle is just another word for letter. Uh, we, we talked, and again, I'm not going to try to give you a, a running commentary in each letter that we'd be here for, for the rest of our lives, and it's so deep. But what I'm trying to do in this series is just give you the context of the letter so you can have it come alive, you know, because these letters were written to real people by a real Paul dealing with real issues and there's backgrounds to these letters. And that's what I wanted to bring out. So uh, Paul's epistles we saw that make up about a quarter of the New Testament. If you add in the 16 chapters of Luke that really relates Paul's life, then a good one third of the New Testament has to do with Paul. It was either written by him or written about him. Most of Paul's letters are what we call occasional letters. And what that means is that there is some specific reason or reasons he was writing a letter. Uh, somebody asked him something or there was some trouble or something. He was trying, to, you know, so one of the things that we can do is kind of think about what is the occasion of this letter, which allows you, uh, gives you a better tool to look at that letter and understand what it is. Uh, and also remember, when we're looking at Paul's letters, for the most part, we are listening to one end of the conversation. So it's like listening into a telephone conversation where you're hearing one end and you can't hear the other end. You can kind of uh, guess what these people are asking or what that, uh, the letter uh, that Paul got that he's responding to, um, but we are listening to one end of the conversation. We uh, Last time, in part five, we looked specifically at the letter to the Romans, which I called 
the Mount Everest of, of letters because uh, it's as close as Paul can't, comes and as close as you find in, I think, Scripture to a systematic theology where he lays out this is what the gospel is and this is what salvation is in a more contemplative way. All right. And so why, what was the occasion of the letter uh, to the Roman church? Well, first he wanted, he had plans to go to Rome. This is before his arrest and stuff. He, he wanted to introduce himself to the believers in Rome because he had never been there and it wasn't his church. Peter had started the church in Rome. So Paul's writing to the believers in Rome saying, Hey, I'm coming. Here's who I am. Um, then he, he under, also understood that there were divisions and tensions between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians in the Roman church. Why? Because uh, the Emperor Claudius had kicked all the Jews out for two years of Rome. And so therefore, in that vacuum, the, the Gentile Christians started you know, running the church because they were the only ones left because the Romans couldn't tell the difference between Gentile or Jewish Christian. They just lumped the Jewish Christians in with all the Jews at this time. And so when the Jews came back after two years, there was obviously tensions like, you know, the, the Jewish Christians would, would think like, well, I'm a Jew, so I, I have a higher status than you. I'm closer to, to that. And then of course the Gentile Christians were like, no, 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 this is my thing now. I'm, I'm, you had your shot. I'm, I'm a Gentile. And you know, the, the Jews didn't respond the, the way they should. So there was a whole bunch of swirl tension uh, between these two groups within the church. And so I think Paul knew that, and you can see some of the things that he addresses in Romans is specifically about, you know, are, is salvation for the Jews only, for the Gentiles only? What's the relationship between those? And then thirdly, to lay the foundation for raising his own support uh, money and, and goods for his intended journey to Spain. He tells that, you know, once he goes to Rome, he, his ultimate destination is to go to Spain, the province of Spain, to uh, to uh, promulgate the gospel. He never made it as far as we know, uh, but certainly, you know, the letter would be a, a good calling part. Um, we call the Romans, and what I call Romans is, when you look at Romans and you read it, it's the contemplative Paul. He's taking his time. He's, he's really explaining things well, and it's, and it's a very long letter, and so it's the contemplative Paul. When you look at First and Second Corinthians, I, I think this is the pastor Paul. You're now seeing Paul as the leader and the pastor of the churches in Corinth that he started. So these are his churches. So he is trying to shepherd them and correct them and give them some guidance a little more directly, a little more practically than what you see the contemplative one in Romans. Uh, it's, an, you know, they're obviously both amazing, but you get a slightly different view of Paul's personality and modes as you look at these various letters. So let's go into Corinthians. I, I think probably the one of the most important contexts you can have is um, just an understanding of the ancient city of Corinth, because that's the kind of stage that First and Second Corinthians is played upon. As you see on the map, uh, Corinth is right in the middle of Greece. Uh, it was an ancient uh, Greek city, uh, all the way on par with Athens and Sparta and Thebes and all these other ancient Greek cities and the the where it's situated it's right on the isthmus that connects the Peloponnese where Sparta was with Athens so it controlled a lot of the trade and it had a huge seaport and that was very important for a seagoing nation so Corinth had always been important now <laughs> What happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. I think this is probably something just to keep in your back of your mind as you read First and Second Corinthians, because Corinth was the combination of boomtowns, you know, Gold Rush San Francisco, and you know, the hedonism of Las Vegas. It was the Las Vegas of the ancient Greek and Roman world. Um, as we said, Corinth was one of the most important city states in the ancient Greece, along with Athens and Sparta. During the uh, Greek phase of it, for a couple hundred, you know, a couple hundred years, they had a temple on the Acro Corinth, which, if you think about in Athens, you have the Acropolis. That just is Greek for high city, Acro and Polis. The Acro Corinth is the high Corinth, so it's the hill in the middle of the city. They had a big temple there, and they had a thousand ritual prostitutes. So you 
if you wanted to get the favor of that goddess, you'd go up there and pay your money and do your stuff. And then hopefully the goddess would, uh, you know, give you blessings. And so Corinth had this reputation as, wow, you know, whatever goes in Corinth, you know, ooh, whatever you wanted. Oh, you're going to Corinth. Ooh, look at that. You're going to Corinth. So that was, that was the reputation of Corinth. From about 214 BC to 146 BC, Rome was, quote, invited to help in the internal Greek wars. And I've said this in multiple studies over the course of a couple of years. If, if an ancient Roman comes up to your house and knocks on the door and offers to help, shut the door. Don't let him in. Because if you let him in, by next morning, you will be sleeping in the shed in the backyard and the Romans will own your house. That's how they built the empire. Uh, all these people, warring city-states would invite Rome on one side or another, and they would never leave. And so there were a whole bunch of Greek, uh, internal Greek wars, and Rome got involved over the course of a hundred years. And eventually, they just took over all of Greece and all the cities. Well, Corinth, uh, being its you know, an important city, they revolted against this Roman rule in 146 BC. And so the Romans can't tolerate that. The worst thing you could possibly do as an individual or as a city or a country is revolt against Rome. And the penalty for that is death and, and destruction. And the city was destroyed. Every inhabitant of this ancient Corinth was either enslaved or killed. And the city itself was just complete rubble. There's nothing left. Like if you go today to go visit Corinth and look at the ruins, these are Roman ruins, not Greek ruins. The, the Greek ruins were wiped out by the Romans. So for about a hundred years, it just stayed there in rubble, but given its location in, at the Isthmus and the seaport, Julius Caesar refounded Corinth in 44 BC, and he seeded it with freed slaves from the Roman Empire and army veterans. So there were no Greeks left there, but then he created a city from scratch. And it eventually became a boom town. It became the Roman provincial capital in Greece, and it was a bustling, important city by Paul's time of 100,000 people. And, but one thing to remember there in the context is there's no old money left. There's no aristocratic families left in Corinth. They were all killed or enslaved, the old Greek ones. Now, so this 100,000 person city would be a combination of you know, Roman slaves, freed slaves, army veterans, merchants from all over the empire, Greeks from all over Greece. It was just a polyglot mix of, of people all scrambling for their piece of the pie. And so money and status was everything. It wasn't, didn't matter which family you came from or oh, I've been here for 300 years and my family is on the council because there was no old money left. It was all new money. And so money and status in that era of Corinth became everything. And it, again, Corinth was, was known as the Las Vegas of the Roman and the Greek world. Matter of fact, if you called somebody a Corinthian girl, that was a euphemism in Greek and Roman times of, of calling her a prostitute. Uh, that was, and even the word Corinthianize had a uh, euphemism for, for um, intercourse. So that's the reputation that Corinth had. And that's where Paul created a church. And so remember, Corinth itself is a combination of like a gold rush San Francisco, everybody scrambling for riches and a modern Las Vegas where, hey, anything goes, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. So what does that mean, you know, for Paul in Corinth? Well, Paul first preached the gospel in Corinth on his second missionary journey in about 50 AD. Uh, Acts 18 tells us that. Um, he stayed with Aquila and Pris Priscilla and made tents for a living. This is the same Aquila and Priscilla who, who during that time where they kicked all the Jews out of Rome, Aquila and Priscilla had to go to Corinth uh, to kind of wait that out. Um, as usual, Paul started evangelizing in the synagogues. That's where he always started in every town and every city he went to. Uh, eventually, Timothy and Silas joined him at, at Corinth, and, and the church in Corinth grew. And when we, again, at this time, the church, when, you, when I say the church in Corinth, you're talking about gatherings in homes, gatherings in the woods. There are no buildings that's called a church. This is the very earliest uh, stuff. As a matter of fact, I'll just reiterate that I've said last time, if you're looking at the 
if you want to see the earliest witnesses to what it meant to be a Christian, you look at Paul's writings. They are the earliest Christian writings we have. They early, they are earlier than the Gospels. Okay, so you're taught you have a window into the very first generation of the believers when you look when you read Paul. So Paul stayed in Corinth for about a year and a half, and obviously grew the church and, and grew leaders, grew elders. He left for Ephesus, which is out in Asia Minor, with the intent of going to Jerusalem with the collection of money that he got from all the other churches to bring to Jerusalem because they were having famine and they were having a hard time. Others like uh, he names Apollos and maybe even the Apostle Peter himself visited Corinth uh, after Paul. So, you know, there were apostles and church leaders coming in and out of Corinth. One question that we could stop here for a second, just ask yourself, what kind of negative influences would the church in Corinth have to deal with just by virtue of being in Corinth? Um, you know, it's imagine there were no Christians at all. They never heard of Christianity in Las Vegas and you went and started a church in Las Vegas. What would, what kind of worldly pressures, cultural pressures, interactions day, on a daily basis pressures would the new believers in the middle of Las Vegas, when there are no other Christians around and the culture is completely counter to what you're trying to do, things would be complicated. You know, the world would constantly try to force you to act in a certain way, regardless of what you're, what, what you wanted to do. And, and, and so it's, and, you know, that's the backdrop of, of the letter to the Corinthians, you know, that the church itself was growing, but Paul wasn't there and they had to deal with living in this kind of Las Vegas boomtown uh, pagan environment. So the occasion of first and second Corinthians is when Paul was in Ephesus af after he left Corinth and went to Ephesus, he started hearing problems, uh, about the church in Corinth. And we know that from a couple different ways. Uh, he probably heard it from three sources. First, it's, it's pretty apparent that he had been in regular letter correspondence with Corinth because in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, he says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. What letter? We don't have that letter. So we know that there are other letters that were going back and forth between Paul and Corinth because obviously Paul was, was the, kind of the leader of that. He, it was his church plant. He wanted to make sure that things were going well. Secondly, somebody from one of the important people in, in Corinth church um, told him of this stuff. So someone in Chloe's house told him of these problems. And 1 Corinthians 1.11 says, my brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household had informed me that there are quarrels among you. So obviously he's hearing stuff through the back door. And lastly, there was a Corinthian delegation that went from Corinth and met him in Ephesus uh, in 1 Corinthians 16, 17. Uh, he writes, I was glad when Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. So those three people were a delegation from the church in Corinth to go meet Paul in Ephesus to give him money probably to take to Jerusalem but he obviously had the op opportunity to sit down and say, well, how are things going in Corinth? I'm hearing stuff. What are you guys actually seeing? So between all those things, he was putting together a picture that there was some turmoil in his beloved church of Corinth. So he wrote first Corinthians to address these problems. That's the occasion. There's problems in the Corinthian church. They're trying to have a church of the earliest Christians in this pagan boom town immoral and there were starting to be divisions and, and, and arguments over various issues. Timothy went to Corinth to try to calm things down, but he couldn't handle the situation by himself. That, that's indicated in Corinthians and in the book of Acts. So then Paul went and visited Corinth, but he calls it in 2 Corinthians a painful visit. It didn't go well, right? So he butted heads with the people who were causing problems in his mind. They, they accused Paul of different things. It was just a painful visit for him. And that's uh, you know, highlighted in 2 Corinthians. And he wrote 2 Corinthians after that painful visit, although it ends on an optimistic note saying he's getting reports that things are evening out and, and people are getting together. 
So that's the occasion of First and Second Corinthians. So what are these problems that Paul were hearing about and is addressing in, in his epistles to the church? So the, one of the big ones is, you know, the church in Corinth were forming factions. And he writes about this right up front in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 11 through 12. He says, um, my brothers uh, and sisters, some from Chloe's household informed me that there are quarrels among you. Uh, what I mean is this. Uh, one of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, I follow Cephas. Cephas is the Aramaic name of the apostle Peter. Still another says, I follow Christ. And that he's just outlines like, how can you guys are creating factions and playing off these leaders one off of another? We're all one in Christ. So he starts talking and addressing that. So that's one of the biggest problems that he's trying to address this division, this growing division in the Corinthian church. Another one is that in general, Paul is, is uh, seeing that some of the people in the Corinthian church think themselves spiritually mature, I'm wise, I'm superior, more so than other people, or they're getting full of themselves. So in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, he writes, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. You are still worldly. So he's trying to do a wake-up call with the, the people in Corinth saying, don't think that you're mature, you're mature in, in the spirit yet. I mean, you're just in baby steps. And stop thinking that you know all the answers. Stop thinking about your pride and how wise you are and how you're better than someone else. Uh, that's, that's not the way of, of the spirit. And then there was a whole set of, of cascading issues, some very specific and practical, uh, that people were arguing over what's the right way to treat it within the Corinthian church. Because remember, this is like the first generation of Christians. Their, their scriptures were the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament yet. It wasn't written. I mean, Paul was writing letters to the Corinthians that would eventually become part of the New Testament. But they were trying to sort this out. They would try to remember what Paul told them. They'd look at the, the Old Testament scriptures, but there were lots of voices saying, oh, we should do this, we should do that. No, no, Paul said this. Well, don't worry about what Paul says. Apollo says this. So Paul was trying to address these things from a pastoral standpoint. So the first uh, uh, issue was there was a, a, a reported case of incest in the, in the Corinthian church. And in general, just the sexual morality. Remember, they were in the Las Vegas of the ancient world. So that was always going to be a danger where they just could not ignore the culture that they were in. Secondly, uh, Paul uh, points out that there are questions about could the believers sue each other you know, into, in the Roman courts? You know, could you bring a suit against a fellow Christian brother who wronged you to the Roman pagan court? Um, then there was a, a lot of questions about marriage and celibacy and unmarriage. You know, is marriage good? Is it better? Or is being unmarried better than marriage? I mean, Paul's unmarried, so maybe we should be like Paul and never marry again. Or celibacy, even if we're married, maybe we should be celibate. That's the highest calling. And so Paul's is trying to address that. Then, of course, his his... The, the always the thing in his backgrounds is, you know, the Judaizers would come behind him and say, oh, you really have to start following the Jewish customs. You have to get circumcised. You've got to eat kosher. And so this whole question of, do you need to be circumcised to follow Jesus? Or even a practical thing, if you're a slave and you convert to uh, Christianity, should you be fully freed? You know, or does your status matter? Um, the other one, the next one is the same as, you know, uh, can you eat food sacrificed to an idol if you're a believer? Why is that pra uh, important? Because in, we, uh, the, the scholars estimate that during Paul's time, there were 26 temples uh, that they've identified within the city of Corinth, pagan temples. And each of those temples would have sacrifices to the gods or goddesses, which would involve birds and, and and animals, and they would take that meat after the sacrifices and sell it in the marketplace. Or you can go to the temple and buy the buy the beef or the oxen that they had just slaughtered. So if you went to a, a 
a dinner party with your pagan friends or even your Christian friends, and you're sitting there, laying there on the couch, and somebody gives you a plate of meat, is, and you find out that that's from a, a pagan temple, should you be able to eat it? Is that a sin? So Paul addresses that. Um, then uh, he also addresses a bunch of controversies about, you know, during the worship, you know, during your, your worshiping of, of uh, getting together in the woods or in somebody's house and you're doing a service, what is the proper way to do that? It doesn't matter how you're dressed. It doesn't matter who does what. Uh, what kind of attitude should you have? So this kind of decorum uh, during worship was important. He addresses some controversies over Lord's Suppers because it, it reflected the division amongst people in Corinth. Since Corinth was so status-driven, money-driven, and uh, some people were isolating themselves. Well, we're going to have the Lord's Supper, but just for a couple people who are in my class, and then the other people can do their Lord's Supper. And that drove Paul nuts, right? And he was trying to say, what are you doing? And then lastly, spiritual gifts. There was some controversy over who could, who could prophesize, who could pray out loud, you know, what that all means. So there were a lot of practical things coming out of these factions being formed and the Corinthian believers, some of them thinking that they were full of themselves, they were holier than thou. And Paul is trying to address that as a father would to children, as a pastor would to his church. Um, I do want to take one little minute here and there's a passage in first Corinthians that I think is a, a really good one to, to do as an exercise to think about how do you, how do you approach interpreting scripture? Um, there are some, some good uh, rules of thumb. So what I want to do is just read this passage to you and then we'll just take a minute and say, how would you approach figuring out what this means? Okay. If you're doing your own study or, Whatever. So in 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 6, he writes, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head, but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head it is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. All right. So what does this mean? What does this mean to us today? So how do you interpret this passage? So if you look at the bottom of the slide, on the left is a current picture of Amish women going to church. They all have their head covered. On the right is a, a current picture of uh, women going to an Orthodox Christian church service. And you know it's tradition there that the women cover their head within the cathedral. So if you look at this passage and you think about um, on the community church, say for example, if you're a woman and you go to church on Sunday and you don't have your head, head uh, covered, are you committing a sin? Are you going against the instruction of inspired scripture that, that Paul wrote to the Corinthians? It's, a, it's an interesting question, right? So uh, here's one way to kind of think through this, how I think through it. and I've been trained in seminary. This is kind of a, a standard approach. So there's a couple of things when you think about that passage. First off, when you're trying to do interpretation of scripture, when you're trying to figure out a hard passage or a hard, hard text, the first couple things to remember. First, you should always try to interpret in chunks of paragraphs and books, not just one sentence, certainly not one word. These are not scripture McNuggets. These were written, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but they were written in within thoughts. You know, and so Paul wrote this. Um, in context. So you have to try to understand that. So you know, the first guidance is always try to look at the overall paragraph, not just one sentence. The second thing to remember is 1 Corinthians was not written to you. You're not a first century, first century ancient Corinthian. You're in the United States in the 21st century. Um, it wasn't written to you, but it was written for you. It was written for all Christians, all believers, for the entire world, for all time. It's inspired scripture. 
Um, but it wasn't written to you specifically, meaning like you wouldn't go look at the Old Testament and if God's telling David, go kill these people, that doesn't mean God's telling you to go kill these people. He told David, then you're trying to figure out what does that mean? What did it mean to them? Then what does it mean to us? So the next step is really trying to kind of think through and research what did it mean to Paul and the Corinthians when Paul wrote this? What, what could that have meant? So when you, when you look at the context and, and you research a little bit, you say, well, ancient Greek and Roman women usually kept their head, their hair covered in public. On the right is a picture of a, what a first century Roman woman would look like and a man, you know, dressed in a toga and a woman would have a veil or a shawl or something or a headdress because that was the, the tradition at the time. If you didn't have your head covered, that said something about you. You were bucking uh, tradition. You were, and, and a woman who had a head shave, which Paul references at that time, was also a form of punishment for someone who was an adulterer or adulteress. So that was a form of shame. And prostitutes, like those thousand prostitutes up at the temple, would have their hair down. All right, they wouldn't be covering up because, the, so there was an equation in Paul's time for a woman in public not to have some kind of headdress of being something that was out of the norm. So what does that mean? That, that you today should, if you go to a church service, you should have your head covered. Well, there are some, some denominations and some branches of Christianity where that's just tradition and they might want to keep that because they think they're closer to what Paul is, te is teaching. But, you know, what we believe in the next step is trying to say, all right, now I know kind of what it meant in context to Paul and the ancient Corinthians. What is the underlying biblical teaching? Now, sometimes when you go through this interpretation, it's the same interpretation today. If, if Christ says, love your neighbor as yourself, you don't have to figure out, well, what does that mean to the ancient people? What does it mean today? It means the same thing love everyone as you do yourself. And there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can go deeper there. But in some of this stuff, you need to kind of think through that. So you're trying to then discover what's the underlying biblical teaching, the timeless biblical teaching beneath that statement. And my interpretation, some other people's interpretation, scholars, uh, would be, here's how I would say it. It's like what Paul, when you extrapolate the general biblical teaching from cover your head, if you're going to pray or prophesize if you're a woman it really applies to both women and men so don't try to be controversial or stand out during a worship service that's not the point don't try to show off or make other believers uncomfortable with how you act how you look be humble be humble like christ be reverent help the other believers don't try to stand out that's not the whole point of this and so that to me would be the underlying biblical teaching. And then your last step is, all right, now that I kind of have that, how does that apply to my life, to the life of my church today? And it might be you have some controversy or some issue you're trying to think through related to this, or it's just a good biblical teaching that the, that the Spirit is giving you through this scripture. So that's just an example of how you can approach that a little bit more systematically rather than just saying, I think it means this. Well. Think through it a little bit. So the core message of First and Second Corinthians, really, uh, I just want to go through as, as kind of a wrap up. So uh, you got to realize that in uh, say First Corinthians fifteen, this is the earliest written list of witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus, um, and this letter is the is Paul's most detailed treatment of the theology of the cross, even more so than in Romans. And so when you want to get the first glimpse, written glimpse of what, you know, who saw Jesus, it's not the gospels. All of the gospels are true and they will give that to you. Paul's letter was written earlier than the gospel. So even at, you know, orally people were teaching, this is what happened when Jesus resurrected. This is how many people they saw. And then Paul, of course, is trying to teach the Corinthians and all of us, what is the, what does the cross mean? What does the cross mean to us? So, you know, his, his thing is that Christ's death on the cross not only saves us, but it also teaches us how to humble ourselves, how to love and serve one another. You follow Christ's example. 
Christ, you know, you are one in Christ. You should treat each other as Christ would treat us, right? You have to be a humble servant. Do not let the world's standards of wisdom, success, status, and power influence your life or the life of the church. Keep your focus on Christ. That was what he was trying to pound in the Corinthians. Like, stop it. I don't care what the pagan world says. I don't care what the, the measure of success and status is in Corinth. You are called to Christ. You are all one in Christ. You keep your focus on Jesus. And don't have divisions in your church. Be united in Christ. There's no Jew. There's no Greek. There's no free. There's no slave. Man, woman, pagan, Gentile. There's all are one in Christ. All believers are one in Christ. There's no division. And lastly, you know, be patient and kind with one another, especially for new believers. Don't put stumbling blocks with your pride and your whatever else in front of people who are just starting out on the path. And he capstones that at the end of the letter of First Corinthians, and he talks about that specifically. Obviously, it's a very famous passage you hear at weddings all the time, but you're, he's trying to teach them what this means. If, you, if you're going to be one in Christ, if you're going to follow the example of Christ on the cross, what is it about? It's about love. It's about the love of one another, love of Christ, love of God. And so in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13, he says, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesize in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then shall I know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And he's telling the Corinthians, love one another. Stop the divisions. Stop the haughtiness. Stop the pride. Stop the spiritual maturity trip that you're on. Love one another. Go back to Christ. Look at the cross. Put, put that stuff at the foot of the cross. And you, your church will, will thrive and, and the believers will help each other. That's the core message to me and to many other commentators of, of the Corinthians. So I'll recap, we talked so far in this series that Paul is the most important figure in the apostolic age uh, uh, of the age of the apostles. He wrote uh, or influenced the majority of the New Testament. He, and he spread the, the faith throughout the Roman Empire. He wrote a large part of the New Testament. He's probably the most important theologian or theology thinker in the church, in the early church. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He had to deal with Judaizers and false teachers at every turn, every turn. And Paul's epistles or letters are foundational for Christian theology. They're, they're like deep wells that ha have no end to them. You, you'll study them for the rest of your life and still have some questions and thoughts that when we're together with Paul, you can ask him like, hey, what'd you mean when you said blah, blah, blah? So it's just phenomenal. And I, I hope this is of use for you. Again, this is trying to give you context for your further studies for, for Paul and Corinthians. Next week, uh, if this goes well, next week I will do my, one of my favorite letters and, and parts of, of the Bible that speaks to me is Galatians. So if we saw in Romans, that was the contemplative Paul. In Corinthians, this is the pastor Paul. In Galatians, it's Paul on with his hair on fire. It's the spitting Paul, like, I can't believe you're doing this. I'm going, I, I got to show you where you're going wrong. And, and to me, the Galatians letter is where I have this most visceral sense, like I'm standing next to Paul, watching him pace up and down and chewing on his beard. It's just it's phenomenal. So uh, I bless uh, all of you. I, I pray to God that everyone's uh, safe and uh, we will uh, pick up this uh, uh, next time. And uh, till then, uh, have a peace in Christ and we'll see you then.